All right, guys. Uh, so this is uh, AI and security, finance and e-commerce. And I realize uh, I, the title is really broad. The AI is broad. I mean, security is broad. Like, everything is really broad. Um, I thought they were going to ask me for like, sort of a more granular title, but uh, they didn't ask me, so they just put it there. So uh, that's my talk. Um, just, and I realized I thought I had an hour of talk, but I, wasn't, uh, I, was, I was notified that I only have 40 minutes. Just, so I'm going to cut a whole lot of stuff. I will talk as much as possible. But at the same time, can I get a raise of hand if you already work on machine learning stuff, data science, or anything like that? OK. Um, anybody work particularly on biometrics? OK, one guy. All right, awesome. So I will kind of, uh, I won't get into too much technical jargon. I will try to kind of do a high level overview so you guys can get a feel for like what's, what's going on and you guys can see, uh, make a judgment for yourself. So my name is Tewu. Uh, that's a Korean name. I live in US. Um, you can tell by the, probably the, by the accent. Uh, so I worked uh, in advertising technology, so I was exposed to a lot of this big data stuff pretty early on in my career. And uh, that's why I learned about machine learning and how you can be used to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, that's a picture of me winning the uh, AT&T hackathon thing, 2017, I think it was. And the company I uh, co-founded is called One Smart Lab. We work on biometrics, um, AI stuff, and we're on Wall Street Journal. So before I get started, I think a lot of people uh, sort of in your professional career, you get asked, like, why do you do what you do? And uh, before I was in advertising, I wasn't sure why. And then I kind of started doing more and more of this AI stuff. And I wasn't really thinking about, like, you know, why do I do what I do? And I don't know if you guys remember, uh, if you guys ever watched a movie about New York City in the 90s. Um, you know, you see, like, this glamorous light, nightlife. People are dancing everywhere. People are having fun and all that stuff. Uh, but that's just the movies, right? And reality, New York City was really bad. I mean, gang fights, you know, gun shootings, muggings, drugs. I mean, anything bad you could think of, New York City had everything. And I grew up during that era. And my family experienced a home invasion. If you guys know what that is, that's when people will actually come to your house and rob you while you're in your house. Uh, it's probably one of the most uh, devastating things that you can experience as a child and having a gun pointing it at you uh, in your house, right, of all the places, it's a place of safety. Uh, so ever since then, I've always had this sort of like a Bruce Wayne stigma. I always wanted to like, you know, do something where I can use my abilities to sort of, you know, help the greater cause. And, uh, you know, I'm a technologist, so I said, you know, what can I do? And, you know, this AI thing just sort of became sort of a natural fit for me. So the talk of scope, biometrics is a huge topic. Um, there's tons of different things, and I'm not going to cover every one of them. That's just not going to be possible within 40 minutes. Um, so with the ones that I want to particularly talk about is uh, the things that are sort of currently being adopted. So there are different types of, the different types of biometrics requires, number one, different types of hardware, uh, different algorithms, and also the third part that people don't think about is user adoption. For some reason, some cultures uh, depending on which culture you go to, some people are willing to uh, submit themselves to certain kinds of biometrics, but not the other. Like, so Asians behave differently than the you know, Westerns, and the Africa is different from like, Latin America. They're all very different. But the ones that seem to get the most sort of universal adoption is face. I think probably because of the fact that now selfie is like a sort of a user, you know, white, globally accepted thing, right? Um, and also, we're going to talk about behavior as well. So let's talk about the traditional uses of machine learning and finance. Uh, the, the most probably the obvious use case is uh, in case of banking. For example, like I want to, I'm a lender. I want to lend money. Who are you the most? Who who should I lend money to so that I can make a profit and not losing money at the same time? So there's simple things like decision trees. Like do you make X amount of dollars? Do you have this kind of uh, job? Do you make this kind of income? Do you live in this house? Do you live in that zip code? It's basically a decision tree that determines whether or not you're credit worthy. But now that's simple, right? I mean, you don't need to have machine learning for that. But what if you had a case of, say, like 100 or 1,000 or even 100,000 attributes of the borrower? How do you exactly qualify this person as worthy? So in simple things like that, uh, you can do clustering algorithms. So basically, suppose you are a, a person with infinite inf attributes, right? And you can actually cluster people into groups, like this group, so, for example, one on the you know, top right, for example, they're not worthy, so we're not going to give them loans. Uh, bottom right, uh, those are people that are sort of higher risk, so you would actually try a higher interest rate. And the bottom left are good, so you just give them whatever loans. Um, but let's talk about more sort of exciting kind of uh, machine learning uh, is in trading. So 
You know, everybody here is technical, right? You guys all want to write algorithms, and that algorithm makes tons of money, right? I mean, that's a good dream to have. Uh, so for the picture on the left, um, if you guys ever done any algorithmic stuff, that's sort of the hello world of uh, algorithmic trading. Basically, based on some signals you trade, and you know, the reverse signals you sell or whatever. By the way, that's from like 30 years ago, so don't you know, go risking your money on that. Uh, but you know, the more interesting use of machine learning are things like you know, using image classification to look at the number of cars at a retailer, for example, so you can actually determine are there more people coming to the retailer. And of course, you can get more granular. You can look at the POS data, like what products are being sold, so you can look at trends, so you can actually you know, buy their stock or whatever. So if you think about it, big retailers like Amazon and Walmart could potentially be hedge funds, but I don't think they do that. Um, other, like if you invest in, say, like e-tailers, you can look at DNS hits to see how many people are looking for Amazon.com versus uh, Wal uh, Walmart.com, for example. Uh, and the other use, there are other interesting uses of uh, recurrent neural networks. Those, if you guys don't know, it's basically AI models for time series. So you can do things like prediction of, uh, so for example, volatility. So stocks go up and down, but you want to know when it goes down up the more and less. So you can actually risk more or risk less based on that volatility. Uh, people have actually tried to use this to predict price, the one in the middle right. Uh, don't use it. It's uh, insane overfitting. If you trade with it, you will lose a ton of money. We've tried it many times. It doesn't work. Uh, other interesting uses are looking at things like hashtags or Google Trends for products mentioned or companies that are mentioned to see if this company has sort of a media momentum. Uh, and e-commerce is relative, it's, I would say it's pretty similar. Um, so one of the, probably Facebook is probably the, the most notorious case of this is predictive advertising, trying to kind of predict what you need before you think you need it. Uh, so, you know, a lot of, they collect a lot of data about you, what you read, um, what are you talking about, where are you hanging out, what are you checking into, and how often, I mean, there's a the correlation of time. How often are you looking at it, and when was the most recent thing that you looked at? Uh, so they try to basically uh, put the advertising in front of you before uh, you start looking for it. So, and of course, Netflix um, recommendation engine. So this is, uh, it's called collabor collaborative filtering. They try to basically guess what, you, what they think you like to watch so that they kind of keep you in the system and of course in the process charging you subscription fee and all that stuff. Um, and the bottom right, uh, if you guys ever dealt with the retailers, one of the biggest issues is inventory risk. They don't want to hold inventory that you know, nobody's going to buy, obviously. So what they try to do is they do this predictive uh, analytics to determine what, predict, uh, what products uh, will get sold in the next season or whatever so that they could do the proper uh, uh, the supply chain planning. And uh, traditionally, using machine learning and security, uh, actually, I wouldn't say a lot of uh, uh, security field people use this, but um, LA, for example, they try to predict out where and when crime is going to occur, and so that they can properly allocate the police resources, so that you know they can be there right about what is about to happen. And I'm sure you guys have seen uh, fingerprint scanning. Uh, problem with fingerprint scanning, um, the reason for you know lack of sort of universal adoption is the fact that on smartphones, for example your fingerprints are already all over the phone. So it's much, much easier to sort of you know, spoof, so sort of fake the, uh, the scans. Um, and there's also issues as well, too, with uh, a lot of companies hold pants on this stuff. Um, HP has this huge patent on fingerprint scanning, and it's one of the reasons why uh, you don't see it a lot. Uh, so history of biometrics. So people think this was like a recent thing, but it's actually not. It started like in the 1800s. Uh, the pictures you see, so there's a police agency in Illinois, United States. They actually started taking pictures of felons, and they actually started sharing uh, with other police agencies to determine who these people are. And also France started that as well, measuring body parts and things of that nature. And sort of in the 80s and 90s, a bunch of professors got together, and uh, they, they, discovered, they invented this thing called eigenfaces. Basically, it's, it's their attempt to do facial recognition without this, this, this deep neural network stuff. Um, not very good, but at the time it was state of the art. Obviously, the most obvious use case of biometrics, you know, if you think about it like in the movies, is the fact that they want to be able to 
solve this issue of too many people but not enough security and law enforcement. Uh, I believe in 2014 there was 30 million cameras in the US uh, shooting something like 2 billion hours worth of footage every week. I mean that's just US. And UK, UK has 1%, less than 1% of the world's population but at the same time they have 20% of the world's CCTV, right? So how do you, how are you gonna look out through all this? It's impossible. And face authentication. So you guys, I'm sure, watch news, and there was this recent uh, development with uh, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, you know, the two most interesting people in the news right now. And at the same time, there was uh, these two gentlemen who looked like them. Uh, they landed in Singapore, and they were so good, like people thought they were them, that the Singapore government asked them to not come back. Well, at least until the summit was over. Uh, so, but you know, that's sort of the lighthearted way of looking at things, but what about in the case of reality? Well, in 2016, over 400 billion records stolen. Um, and of course, these things get sold, and you know, these get hackers, they try to, you know, what do they do with it? Well, they apply for bank loans, they apply for government services, um, you know, tax, they push on tax liabilities to you. It's all kinds of crazy stuff, right? And how do you protect against, even if your identity gets stolen, how does the, the person checking your identity make sure that you are you? Uh, so, a lot of this stuff doesn't really matter, like you know, people stealing identities, until somebody starts losing money. And uh, if you guys don't know what money laundering is, basically money laundering is a way to turn dirty money into clean money. Uh, so suppose you sell drugs, right? You're a drug dealer, you sold millions of drugs. Now, now you wanna buy a house and a car with it. How do you do that? Well, you can't go to the bank and say, hey, I wanna buy this stuff, and by the way, here's my drug money. You can't say that. So the way they do it is they would go to like a ca casino, for example, and make a deal with the casino. I'll give you a million dollars, I'm gonna lose it, but you're gonna give me back 900,000, you can keep 100,000 as commission. So casinos are notorious for this, but that's not the only thing. Banks, payment transfer companies, real estate, anything really expensive like cars. Um, so money laundering is huge. So UNODC, that's the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, they think that approximately 5% of the world's GDP um, is basically laundered this way. And in developing countries, much higher. Um, I've seen stats as high as 50%. Uh, so any term, anytime you're transferring something to another person, money, asset of some sort, um, there's bound to be some sort of, you know, kind of a money laundering issue. And of course, a new kid on the blog is cryptocurrency, right? The fact that, you, you know, there's no ID associated with the transaction other than just some random hash, like doesn't doesn't mean anything. To, to the uh, regulators. So it's probably gonna get more traction. And of course, as the world gains more adoption with the credit cards and mobile payments, there'll probably be more of that. And banks want you to know, I mean, it's the government want the banks to know who these people are. Okay, so let's kind of get to face detection 101. Um, if you guys already do it, it might be a little simple for you guys, but I'll kind of go quick. Um, so, you know, CSI, I'm sure you guys seen TV shows where like somebody's walking through and bam, like they, they get them right there. Uh, before it was Hollywood, I would say, but in the, probably the past three to four years, it's been sort of more and more uh, reality and just more commercial applications coming up. So in the pre-DNN, so DNN is deep neural network days, people were actually pre-programming the attributes, the features of the face that are important in determining uh, what is a face and what are the most important criteria. Problem with that approach is that uh, there's some cases where actually, there's a bunch of cases where these algorithms will break. For example, if half of your face is covered, if you're wearing a hat, if you wear uh, glasses, um, if your head is slightly tilted, or if your head is at a slight angle. Uh, so deep neural network basically fix all that stuff. So now it's uh, positional and rotational invariant. So it doesn't matter where you are, where your face is in the picture. It can actually determine who you are or where it is. And one of the interesting features is that the deep neural network actually sort of crunches down your face to a, like a hash, basically. So a number, this number by itself doesn't mean anything, but you can do interesting stuff. Like for example, um, uh, clustering. Like I can actually cluster faces and see if your face is similar to the other faces. Or I can compare two faces and say, hey, are these faces the same? So here's a hello world of face recognition. So if you guys never done it, it's super simple. Um, so OpenCV is uh, it's, uh, Open Computer Vision, has a classifier. Basically, you just load up a file that has all the sort of the, the metrics of what determines a face. 
you read a file into a NumPy array, you call that detect multiscale, and what it gives you is basically, sorry, my pointer there? Oh, it basically gives you bounding faces, so x, y, width, and height of facial features like eyes, you know, nose, lips, things of that nature. However, not very good. Uh, step up is actually Dlib. Um, you guys could try it yourself. It's super simple as well. You load an image, um, you can get the encodings. I'll talk about what encodings are. And it can actually compare faces and see, is this person the actual face? Uh, so the, this is the more sort of the advanced, sort of state of the art right now. Uh, it's called FaceNet and OpenFace. So these are deep neural network based. Um, if you guys work with TensorFlow, uh, this should be fairly straight and simple. You open a graph, you open a session, you load the model weights, and you get the input and output tensors, and then you run the model, and it gives you basically a whole bunch of numbers, right? This is basically a NumPy array. Basically, it has no meaning, right? These, this isn't like RGB values. These are actually the output of the model, the final model layer. So it's interesting because your face becomes like a code, right? Like a hash code. And what you can do is actually can compare two faces. For example, uh, you can say, hey, is this person on top left, is that the same as top right? I mean, to a human, yeah, they're the same people, right? However, a little, you can get more tricky, like, hey, how about the bottom left and bottom right? I mean, the guy in the bottom right kind of looks like him, but you know, if you look closely, that you can tell it's not the same person. And the way you do that is, uh, so this, and if you go back, so basically your face is a 512, in this specific example, it's a 512 dimensional uh, NumPy array that, that represents what that face is. So if you guys remember in high school or college, uh, Euclidean distance, right? So you, you take two points in a plane, how do you calculate the shortest distance, right? And it's that formula you see on the bottom right there. But if you have 512 dimensions, right, how do you do that? You basically, basically sum up all of them, take the difference, and then you square it. And then what you get are basically these numbers, like 0.3, 1.12. So you can actually tell, given two faces, are they equal? But more interesting stuff is like, you can actually cluster faces together. So given a whole bunch of you know, NumPy arrays of these face hashes, can you cluster them so that they're sort of similar? Now, so what's an interesting use case of this? Uh, so for example, suppose you're a drug dealer and you sell drugs with a whole bunch of people. And uh, the police wanna know who are your sort of colleagues, right? they wanna catch you. So what they do is they actually have these cameras, they run cluster, clustering algorithms on these faces and then determine that these group are often seen together, and these groups are often seen together. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, other things you can do is called landmark detection. Basically, these are points of the face that are important in determining what a face is. Interesting use case is that they can actually look at your face and see where you're looking at. People used to look at eyes to determine where you're looking at, but now they're actually using head pose estimation to determine where you're looking. So one of the interesting use cases of this is in advertising. So in a lot of infomercial companies now are actually using this to determine if you're looking at whatever that they're presenting so that you know, they can make the right kind of advertising so they can tweak here, tweak there. Because you know, infomercials are very expensive to, uh, not to make, but to actually get it on TV. Uh, so let me talk about sort of the issues with machine learning, uh, well, computer vision and machine learning in general, is that Lighting is super important. Um, so there are cameras that attempt to solve this. There are the RGBD cameras. There are cameras that can do, you know, you might think about thermal, night vision, and all that stuff. But right now, we are sort of limited to these cheap RGB cameras that um, are basically being fed into the machine learning models. Now, a lot, the second issue, too, is that the position of the camera relative to the face is super important. So when you look at a lot of this face recognition training data set, it's pretty much one pose, which is sort of this like selfie camera pose, which is the face is in the smack in the middle of the picture and they're looking at you. However, when you apply this in real life, for example, CCTVs where the camera is actually above you and at a slight angle, uh, a lot of detections don't work uh, because of that aspect. Uh, and training set matters too. So a lot of the open source face stuff that you guys can actually use on the web right now um, they're trained on white people's faces. I don't think they're trying to be racist or anything. It's just that these training models, the, the data set that you need them to train them on, they tend to be, uh, the ones that you can readily ac access are the ones that are linked to Hollywood celebrities for some, some reason. So if you run these models, 
on, say, you know, non-white face, you know, like black, Hispanic, uh, Asian, a uh, Indian. They do work, but not great. Uh, other issues is you know, lack of training data. So my company got approached by a drone company um, asking if they can actually classify diseased sugarcane, uh, I guess, trees or whatever we call these things. Um, because what happens is right now in Thailand, if there's a diseased sugarcane field, what they do is they just torch the whole thing. So they might find like a little tiny localized area, but they just burn down the whole farm. So it's really expensive. So what they wanted to do was they want to have a drone basically go fly over and detect these things so they can actually go and just pull them out. Problem is, there's no data. And to acquire this data would, uh, would have uh, required significant amount of sort of time and investment, especially from a guy who knows what a sh diseased sugarcane field looks like. Um, so it was sort of not worth it. So, it, so you got to ask yourself, if you do this stuff, is, is there an ROI? Like if you invest this much money in data acquisition, and you guys will, once you guys, once you guys start doing machine learning, you'll find that data acquisition cleaning is actually a lot far, far harder than doing the actual ML stuff. Um, of, of course, biased data is a big issue in, in machine learning. Uh, if you guys haven't seen the picture on the bottom left, that's Google AI predicting black people as gorillas. Uh, and also there's the one on the right you see, some guy wrote an AI model to determine whether or not you know, the AI thinks you're gay, right? However, uh, you have to understand machine learning isn't like, it's not a racist thing, right? It just basically, you, whatever you feed it, it just accentuates it. So if you feed machine learning model faces saying like, you know, gay guy looks like this on top right, right? And the uh, straight girl looks like bottom left. If you feed them that, it will just basically just accentuate whatever you think it's supposed to be. So is it completely, object, uh, com completely objective? I don't think so. so. I mean, it's basically whoever trained the model will basically determine that. Um, so other issues surrounding face recognition is that with any sort of technology, there's people bound to sort of try to want to hack it. Um, so a good example is like people actually would take a picture of, the, like suppose I want to steal somebody's face and I'm going to you know, open your bank account and I'm going to transfer money to myself. Um, so this is called spoofing. So one of the ways they do it is they will print the victim's face onto a picture or they'll download them onto their phone and or actually the, one of the more interesting ones is you can actually upload a picture of the victim's face to a website and they will actually print out a mask for you. It's like a like synthetic material. And what they do is uh, they would actually point that camera, uh, point the, the material to the, where the camera is that's looking for your face. And this actually worked pretty, this spoofing attack works pretty well on Android. Um, and also that's, I believe that's Windows 8 or 10 on the bottom right. So a lot of uh, companies have tried to sort of fix this. Uh, so one of the ways they do it is they look to see if your face is real. Like, are you blinking? Are you, like, is your nose twitching? Um, or, or something like that. Uh, or they'll look for other information, like, is there a hand, are your hands next to your face? Like, why would they be next to your face if you're taking a picture of your face for the sake of face recognition? So it's kind of sort of a telltale sign that you're, you're doing something funny. Other ones, um, the, f the face, seen through a camera, natural camera, is different than say, uh, you know, picture that's seen through a camera, it has different texture in us. Other ones are uh, landmark, remember I mentioned the landmarks, the points that determine what a face is. Uh, so what they do is they try to see if it has 3D sort of aspects to it. Um, we tried all of them, they all break in certain aspects, like for example, uh, the 3D landmark thing, if you tape the picture, if you cut out the, the, the white edges and if you tape it against your face, it actually it breaks it. So uh, the way we did it was actually we took sort of this uh, internet sort of security stack model, right? You have security on every layer. And so if you break, breaking one layer is relatively easy, but to break every one of them is much more uh, difficult. So what we did was uh, we actually, instead of asking people to upload an image, we asked them to record a video of yourself. Um, so instead of having one single image, we have a six second video at 15 frames per second. That's over 90, right? I mean, if you higher the frame rate, then the more images you get. So we, co we, we combine um, the standard CNN, which is like an image AI model, with uh, LSTM, which is a uh, time-based um, models. And we combine both, and also we add behavioral biometrics. We actually ask people to 
say a sequence of numbers. This is like similar to like a CAPTCHA on a website, right? Enter these numbers. Um, so we combine video, audio, and behavioral, and this seemed to work pretty well. The only time it sort of broke was uh, these twins. They were like 10 years old. Um, they actually broke on that specific case. Uh, but other than that, it worked pretty well. So let's talk about face, uh, where is face recognition done other than on your phone. So a big chunk of the world's um, security you know, personnel on the entire world, actually their job isn't to do any kind of securing at all. Their job is to basically authenticate your face against a document of your face to make sure that you are who you claim this document says. So obviously uh, the most obvious use case is like airports and customs, right? And, and banks too. Banks or any sort of self-serve platforms where you are you know, authenticating yourself, transferring some sort of an asset. Um, so this is China, I believe, but now it's sort of getting adoption in other countries too. You can pay with your face because your face is sort of the ultimate uh, ID, right? Like you don't need a smartphone app, you don't need a SMS code, you don't need anything. It's, your face is your ID. Um, so on-demand service economies like Uber, like if you, you know, they have like millions of drivers, how do you make sure that they are who they are? And of course, cryptocurrency payment transfer companies. Um, this particular, oops, sorry about that. This particular use case was actually, um, I can't say who, but it's a bank transfer company out of Thailand that they had this problem that people were actually trying to access other people's accounts. Um, so, okay, I made that pretty quick. Um, I skipped a couple of slides, but um, I'll keep it short. Um, so that's it for me. I, um, I'll take questions, and if you want to contact me, if you have any problems, Similar to that nature, ID verification, all that stuff. Uh, we're currently working with a um, company out of South Africa. They have this problem of, uh, uh, what do you call those, uh, those security trucks that carry cash? Um, anyway, so they get hijacked a lot. So they want to add sort of predictive type analytics where there's cars that are approaching it frequently to, to sort of scope it out before they kind of hijack it. Um, they want to be able to take preemptive strikes on that. Um, so anyway, that's it. Uh, I made it relatively short because I wasn't sure how much time I had. So, uh, so any, any, have any questions? And I skipped all the ethical stuff because uh, it was a little too long. <laughs> a lot of people ask me about this stuff. So. Thank you for your talk. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about your company? Um, Sure. What do you do on a daily basis? Uh, what kind of stuff do you do? Um, um, how many people are there? And, uh, well, so, yeah, that's, so let me kind of go back. Um, sorry. Okay, so there's a couple of things. Uh, so machine learning stuff, I mean, you know, getting it to work is not the hard part. It's actually the, the you know, the infrastructure stuff. Like, for example, like if you want to, Compare your face against, say, I don't know, like you know, million known faces. For example, uh, in U.S., they keep a database of uh, sex offenders, people who've had uh, bankruptcies, any kind of lawsuit. Uh, so there's one called, it's called thing called PEP, uh, politically exposed people, um, people that have some kind of political, I guess, uh, sensitivity. You know, these might be like refugees, um, escaped convicts, politicians with corruption records, like all kinds of stuff. Uh, so. We have to make sure that the return, the response that the, the search gets is in within res reasonable amount of time, right? So we work on a lot of infrastructure stuff. And also, we're constantly training faces. Like, we're, any, any data source we can get, um, it's, this is a combination of us sort of like, you know, crawling the web. Um, and of course, we're GDPR compliant. Um, the customers, private data sources, and whatever's on, on the public data sources. Uh, so this, we work with that as well, too. And, a lot of customers have different needs. So like for example, this South African truck thing, uh, they have a problem with uh, data being super expensive, right? So we can't host cloud. So now we have to sort of engineer sort of like a box, right? They, they can actually do all the sort of local computing and upload as needed. So it's a combination of so customizing, making sure the infrastructure works, and constant uploading and um, just sort of training the data, making tweaking the models. Because if you just download stuff off the web and you just like train it against your thing, most likely it won't work exactly the way um, you know. For example, if you read archive, um, arch if you're a data scientist, I'm sure you spend a lot of time on archive.org, right? A R X I V. Uh, 
reproducing their results is like pulling hair out of your just you just go bald, right? I mean, because it's what they say it doesn't match what you get. Um, so a lot of it is sort of tweaking. So there are a lot of these sort of like evolutionary search algorithms to basically determine hyperparameter optimization, all that stuff. Um, and what was the other question? Oh, so right now it's four. Um, so we were the, the other contractors that come in and out, and uh, you know we have uh, R and D sort of consultants as well too. So, yeah, yeah. Hi. <clears throat> so in uh, like your example of the sugarcane, mm -hmm. if you were to actually do that project, mm -hmm. how much data are, you, are we talking about here that you need, that you need to collect? Uh, well, here's the good thing about machine learning is that um, at some critical point, it's sort of uh, exponentially easier. Uh, but what is that critical point? I'm not certain because there's so many factors. For example, these drones carry, they're, they're HD, right? But they don't always fly at the time the, the most, they, they always have to fly. But the data you might get, example, for example, isn't always ideal, right? So let's say you collect data on a sunny day. But what if it's raining and you know the vision cloudy, right? And there's all these sort of real life sort of factors and variants that you have to account for. So how much data do you need? I would say, you know, for it to be good, um, I mean, minimum I would say, you know, start a couple hundred, a couple thousand, um, you know. But the problem is, suppose you have like 24 hours of footage, but you get you know one instance of the actual disease sugarcane, right? So that means you have to fly this for at least a thousand days, right? Because, I mean, this is actually a pretty well-known thing. Like a lot of people use machine learning vision stuff to detect, for example, cancer. But out of a billion x-rays taken a year, let's say, right? Only a few of them have actually positive uh, detection of cancer. And you need, first of all, you need a human to look at it. And two, you need large enough sample to do it. Because what happens if you feed a billion images, but only 10 of them have cancer, all it has to do is 99.999% of the time say, say, always say no, you don't have cancer, then you have a correct, accurate, uh, correct model. And you don't want that, right? You want it to actually be able to objectively say, yes, there's a cancer there, not there. Not just like randomly guess, like, no, it's not there, mm -hmm. right? So you need that balanced data set for it to work properly. I mean, so, so you're facing this problem of, uh, let's say you're doing super, supervised learning, mm -hmm. right? And, and you don't, there's no kind of, you know, data that, that's pre, um, what do you call it, labeled mm -hmm. before, before mm -hmm. you know? So if you're dealing with, I don't know, millions and billions of, you know, data points, like... Sure, sure. Uh, how, how do you actually, I don't know, how do you actually kind of do the cost benefit of, you know, should I undertake this project if I don't have yeah, that Yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that's sort of beyond the scope of this topic, um, of this talk, but um, that's something that you have to answer yourself, I guess. Because, uh, yeah, cost of debt acquisition is high. I mean, it's not going to be cheap. Like, for example, the real world stuff, you know, this isn't like stuff you can scrape off the web, right? Like, a lot of faces you can pretty much get off, like, dating websites or something like that, right? or Facebook or something. Um, you know, but don't break anybody's TOS, I'm just saying. Um, but you know what I'm saying. It's the, the virtual world is a lot easier, right? For example, reinforcement learning of... Um, of these sort of automatons in the virtual world, like you know, training your AI against a game is a lot easier than having a robot. If a robot falls over and his pa head pops out, that's like a thousand dollar damage, right? So it's a lot harder to do that. So this is all sort of cost benefit analysis that you have to do yourself. Um, but you know, we work with clients to kind of give them guidelines on what works. For example, our um, ID verification with anti-spoofing thing, it's just an API call. So. For them, it's just like they just call one thing, and you know they just have the person upload the picture of the face with an ID, and then we just do it. But in in these custom cases, it's yeah, you have to do it yourself. It's uh, you have to calculate: is this worth doing, basically? Um, so we're having a ten-minute break after this, and the next one starts at eleven twenty. And I guess you can keep the questions going until eleven twenty. Oh, okay. So yeah, this talk I cut out like. 50 slides because I wasn't, sh I wasn't sure. Uh, I thought I had an hour plus, but if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, um, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. It's very interesting. I just want to ask you because I'm a twin. Uh huh. I myself a twin. Whether yep. this kind of how does, how far does it go? Will it get me in trouble at some point? Because let's say my brother lives in Europe. Yeah. 
and whether he goes in some, you know, my parents, they, they couldn't tell us apart. Oh, really? When we were kids. Oh, when so you were kids? I traveled on his passport. I, even if I would step in the house of my neighbors, they wouldn't see it. Right. I mean, it's just your face, yeah? It's just your, right. your personality. They wouldn't even see the difference. So with this face recognition, I mean, would it go that far that they could so I talked to a determine couple of this? So like, like you say, like yeah. uh, that my brother goes into a somewhere and that right. I have to prove that I was not there. Like, let's say yeah, so the, uh, I talked to a couple of doctors. Basically, your face, even twins, their face starts differentiating to a point where even, uh, even just like you don't need an AI. You can just use hey, humans can I detect whether they're, they're, they're different. So there's some kind of a critical age, I forget what it was. I guess puberty is when your face starts to kind of start changing and stuff. So like a lot of the tests we did on uh, younger twins, um, we, had, we had trouble. But at some point, I think it was like above 15 or something like that, it was, they could detect. Okay, so I'll yeah. be fine. Yeah, yeah, like I mean, it's not like a, you know, they're gonna be like, oh, hey, you, your brother, your brother mur murdered somebody, but you're gonna take the heat for it. No, it's not like that, yeah. Okay, thank yep. you. Yep. Uh, hello. Yeah. I uh, just new in uh, AI term. Uh -huh. uh, I if I want to uh, create uh, my program that can uh, use face recognition, uh, can you suggest me about a uh, library of Python or something like that? Oh, uh, so using Python? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. There's like one literally called face recognition. It's like it's called face recognition. You can just Google it. Like it's just GitHub. Just Google GitHub face recognition. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's not like state of the art, but for the most, if you're using, I mean, if these are selfie pictures that you're trying to detect faces on. Yeah, most of them will do the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, so um, I have been um, try playing with the face net and you know usual uh, mm -hmm. face matching and stuff for my work. Mm -hmm. um, so. What I can tell is uh, it doesn't um, very accurately um, distinguish a person, at least for Thai faces. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, I'm not sure if you do it differently. For example, the face net, I think it uh, do the Euclidean distance thing. Mm -hmm. um, and we found a few matches that are two different person, mm -hmm. that, but it's, a, it's the same person. Yeah. Um, and uh, my colleagues kind of uh, suggested, okay, we better go like um, do the machine learning thing mm -hmm. uh, that we put in a lots and lots of uh, photos mm -hmm. and tell them this is a, a match, the same person, or this is a different person, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. let them learn. But I think then the machine would learn from the existing data set only, like, uh, okay, if we fit in the twins, and uh, okay, this different person, but if we have another pair of twins, but I, I don't think the model would be able to detect if we don't. If Are you, we're everything. using the standard uh, model weights? Wait, like when you can just download off the web? Yeah, kind of. Uh, yeah, if you use those, from it won't work. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it works horribly on Asian faces. We tested many times. So we actually have custom models now. That's what we use, so. And, and that's uh, your secret for that? Uh, well, it's not secret so much as how do you do the, the data processing and the cleaning and, you know, how do you get the data and make sure it's cheap and, you know, it's basically mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. but, but if you just use a standard one, you can just download off the web. For Asian faces, it will just, for non-white faces, actually, like blacks, Hispanics, mm -hmm. Indians, it will all kind of miserably, I wouldn't say miserably fail. I would say it fails a uh, good 30% uh, of the time, maybe 23%. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. So. So, so you do you uh, have a lot of data to track? Yeah, I mean, I think I think if any di data scientists here, I mean, you spend a lot of time looking for data. Yeah. How do you get it? How do you get it cheap? How do you clean it? How yeah. do you clean it cheap? Right? Yeah. Uh, cheap is the word here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Right.